All right, hello and welcome uh, to this project briefing on social annotation across content, Hypothesis and JSTOR, a case study. I'm Jeremy Dean from Hypothesis. We build social annotation or social reading technology, and I'm VP of Education, which means I oversee our education products and services. Uh, this is my first time at CNI, and I'm thrilled to be here. I'm here uh, thanks today to my longtime colleague and collaborator, Alex Humphreys from Ithaca JSTOR, where he is VP of Innovation. They are, of course, a CNI member organization, and it was really his idea uh, to share this project uh, we've been working on with this community, and like I said, I'm excited to do so. And we're joined here uh, also by Laisha Palin, who is really the rock star of the panel. Sorry, Alex. Um, distinguished Professor of Information Science at CU Boulder. Uh, Leisha's our rock star because she's a computer scientist and information scientist, uh, so I think she's got things very relevant to this uh, community. Um, and she's also one of the most enthusiastic and innovative users of our tool, Hypothesis, in the classroom, and she was able to join us coming down from, from Boulder today. So, down? Is it down? Boulder's north, I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So a brief look at the agenda. I'm going to offer an uh, introduction to what Hypothesis is, since it might not be, some of you might not be familiar. Laisha will give the pedagogical perspective and discuss how she's used Hypothesis in her courses. And Alex will discuss why this matters to JSTOR and maybe why this matters to many in the audience who are in the, in the business of libraries and working with libraries, um, and share details of the pilot project that we've been working on. Uh, and then we'll, provide you all, uh, then we'll provoke you all in a discussion on how we might scale the project that uh, we'll share today. So Hypothesis was founded by Dan Whaley, who's sitting in the audience. Maybe you can wave his hand. Um, Dan saw a problem with information on the web. He recognized that much of, this con of the content on the web did not provide space for discussion. And where comments were enabled, it wasn't particularly healthy discussion. And on the other hand, he saw the emergence of social networks that could be powerful places for people to engage in discussion, but themselves could be unhealthy, in part because they were separate from the context in which they were engaged. Put simply, content and conversation were disconnected. So we founded Hypothesis, and this is our mission, uh, to build new infrastructure connecting the, connecting the world's people and ideas over every web page and document on every platform, like Google Docs, but everywhere. And our solution is a standards-based open source framework that enables diverse collaborative services wherever you are, all based on a new unit of speech, the annotation. Now, I'm an English professor, so I would quibble with it as a new unit of speech, but I think it is being used powerfully in a new context. Um, and that's really what excited me about uh, joining Hypothesis originally. Uh, when I taught, I always emphasized annotation in my courses because I knew that reading closely and thinking and writing about the reading was critical to my students' success. But I also believe that those skills and practices were critical to a healthy democratic society more broadly. The, the idea is that instead of sharing a web page or a document, you can share a link to a piece of content within that resource along with your commentary. As a former Hypothesis colleague has described it, if the web is an information fabric, web annotation increases the thread count of that fabric. And of course, we all want higher thread count sheets, right? <laughs> One of the critical things that we recognized early on was that if this was gonna be done right, the infrastructure was key. This functionality could not be proprietary, so Hy Hypothesis was open source from the start. And it had to be interoperable. So early on, we advocated for and led an initiative to make annotation a web standard through the W3C. And this is what it might look like. A single place to access and organize your notes as you explore the web and other resources. A single space to engage in conversation and community building across that content. There are a wide, ranges, a wide range of use cases that Hypothesis has already enabled through our technology. There's, of course, the everyday internet citizens and how they engage with content and with each other online. There's how scholars engage with the information that is on the web. For example, the Climate Feedback Group is a collection of climatologists who use hypothesis to comment on popular journalistic coverage of climate change, sometimes provoking retractions through their work. There is scholarly publishing itself, from BioArchive using hypothesis for feedback on preprints, to the journal eLife using hypothesis in peer review, to a wide range of journals using Hypothesis for community engagement post-publication. And then there is the classroom context, which will be our focus today. The value proposition is three-way for students, teachers, and, sc and schools overall. For students, the tool makes learning fun, and it provides them note-taking and discussion functionality everywhere they go. For teachers, it engages the students so they can see that they've done the reading and know where they're struggling. 
And for schools, this can improve retention. And we can provide rich data on this fundamental activity that is reading for, for classes. A key thing that we did when we started building out for education was to integrate in the learning management system. For those in the libraries, I don't know how much you're interacting with the learning management systems, but the LMS is the everyday hub for students and teachers. It's where rosters are added by the registrar. Teachers enter grades there, students submit assignments. And tools like Hypothesis can integrate through the learning tool interoperability standard uh, so that students and teachers can access tools like Hypothesis without having to log in. Hypothesis now works with over 300 institutions of higher education, largely North America. I know many of these schools are represented uh, in the attendees today. We largely work with digital learning offices and centers for teaching and learning, but I think there's a real opportunity for us to work more closely with many of you here who work out of the libraries. I want to close by sharing the results of a study we conducted last spring at University of Minnesota in a freshman composition course. If you can see it, this, show, this shows engagement data with course materials over the duration of a term. The red is from the sections not using hypothesis. The green is from the courses using hypothesis. And what we're seeing is that the students using hypothesis are more engaged with the content over time, accessing it more frequently, as the data here shows. I think every teacher and everyone involved in storing reading materials for courses, like those in the libraries, would want to see this kind of sustained engagement with the content. But for more on what hypothesis social orientation looks like in the classroom, I'm going to hand it to Laisha. Thanks, Jeremy. Hey, everybody. I'm Laisha Palin. I'm really glad to be here from the University of Colorado. This, this seems like a really exciting conference, and I'm glad to be able to talk about um, the way uh, we've been using hypothesis in the classroom. It's been a real transformative experience for me as an instructor, 25 years of instruction, but in this last year and a half, I feel like I've done uh, inc improved leaps and bounds in my own pedagogical practice with students, and that the students themselves are also telling me that they're having a very different kind of experience in my classroom, and to me, I think it's because of what I'm able to do with readings, assigned readings, difficult readings, with hypothesis as a support for me and for them. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, what we're doing and what I'm doing. The first thing I might want to um, just make sure you're all aware of, or maybe recall your own college experience, which is that most students don't do the readings um, that they're assigned. And if you don't want to admit that, I'll at least admit that even as somebody who eventually became a professor, I myself didn't always do the readings that I was assigned in the classroom. And what a loss that was, because I ended up having to reread all of them anyway to move into my, my position as a professor. Um, and so uh, one of the only, you know, the ways we can reinforce that is to, one, not reinforce it and just regurgitate the material in the classroom the next time, therefore disincentivizing the students who actually did do the work. Um, we can cold call a student to, to, to embarrass them and hopefully next time they'll read the reading if they didn't do the reading. We can give pop quizzes. And all these are very kind of confrontational ways of engaging with students in the material, which is not what you want in a classroom where you're trying to bring people along for 15 weeks, ideally in a learning community, if you can at least, if you can create that. And you can't create a community when you're in this kind of, um, this kind of relationship where you're testing um, their, their, their reading and their commitment to the material. Um, and so when students don't read, it really drives the, um, the content of the course, what can be done in the course in the classroom to the lowest common denominator. And so the opportunity we have today with the state of the art, with these hypertext support technologies, with hypothesis in particular, is to move readings from this peripheral thing that we assign and can't quite depend on as instructors to something that becomes a centerpiece around which we can have elaborate discussions um, and springboard uh, new, the, our projects and other related work that we do because we know everyone has read the reading. Um, and so, uh, yes, yeah, so my point is that the readings, as you'll see in an example, is that they become sites for peer-to-peer -peer interaction and for my individual interaction with students. And it really creates a much more customized experience for students, even in a fairly large classroom when I can't speak to everyone every single time with every single reading. I get to every student a couple times over the course of the semester, and so they feel that my involvement is right alongside them in that reading. All right. Um, and so what I'm going to show you now is um, after um, 
uh, an example from a sophomore class I taught last semester. Um, it was a sophomore level class, 2000 level class, but it had mostly freshmen and sophomores in it. And we had to engage with some really difficult material. Um, it's, uh, we're in a new department of information science. Many of you might know what that is, but many people, others do not. And there aren't textbooks really for information science. And so we rely on the research literature to um, teach students important things around methods, um, and the philosophies of information science. And so this class is called Information Ecosystems and it teaches about the social life of information, which itself is sort of a heady kind of topic. Um, and so we're really asking students to deal with abstract concepts right away. And, um, uh, and so the one example I wanna show you today is a demo from um, a paper that they were assigned that had just been published or was about to be published. I'm a co-author on it. Uh, but we were getting into some very difficult issues around disinformation and the rise of disinformation during the COVID pandemic as it related to vaccine resistance and as it was tied to medical racism. So I just said four very you know, big ideas <laughs> that are all tied together in this paper, looking at large scale social media records to um, show students how these, how these things come together and how they might want to research them. So let me, so I think I have to exit to get out of this view and get into my demo view here. Um, how did I get back? I don't see the tab at I the top. Type, oh, there we are, okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> All right, let me just relaunch this. So um, I'm not gonna give you a full-blown demo of hypothesis, but this is the real live reading that we had in class. And I wanna show you first, just the extent of this um, research paper, its length, and I remember giving this to sophomores, its length and its mix of methods, um, which are both quantitative and qualitative. In this paper, they're encountering the Tuskegee syphilis study, which is the first time many of them have encountered this. Um, so we have to establish what medical racism is, and then we have to establish how it's being re uh, or co-opted once again in some complex argumentation around the COVID-19 vaccine distribution. So I just wanna show you the, I'm just scanning through just to show you the range of, this is qualitative interpretivist work that they're reading about here, and then they actually get down to network, um, uh, gra network graphs that show how different groups are communicating with each other, so it's a large, it's a big range of material. And then what you see over here on the right are the students' annotations. And um, I'm going to specifically show you uh, how they respond to my prompts and a little bit about how I've developed my pedagogy here uh, just to show you what, how powerful this can be. So here you see all my annotations that I've made and I have two types. One is a, a guidance um, annotation, which um, gives students I, I landmark things for them and give them background that if I could be with them one-on-one -on -one in a much smaller group, I might say, hey, you might not understand this phrase, this is what this means. If you wanna learn more about this, go here. Um, this is a really difficult piece, <coughs> this is the big point, skim over that and don't struggle there, I want you to focus on something else. Um, so those are, that's the guidance, so they feel supported and coached when they're tackling a big paper. And then I give them prompts, and the prompts they have to answer. And the prompts are a range of pretty difficult questions that ask them to reflect on what the reading means. Um, it asks them to summarize what different parts of the reading says. It asks them to respond in their own personal experience. And so I do a whole mix of things. And for a paper of this size, about 30 pages, I have about 25 annotations throughout, prompts throughout. And the reason I say that is, is that by having the annotations throughout, they actually have to read the whole paper rather than just skip from one annotation to another, which they'll do if you only put in three, and I learned that lesson. So the trick is, if you get them to read the whole paper, they're at first a little bit resentful of Professor Palin, but then after that very first reading, they get through the whole paper, and these are students who are hearing, they're, I mean, you know, they're in such pain right now. They're experiencing all these things in the world around uh, with what we're experiencing. They, they're looking for careers. Information science sounds like something that might help them solve these problems, but even for them, it's a hard thing to define. By the time they get to the end of this paper, they have said to me, Professor Palin, 
I finally understand information science, and I see how all these things come together. And it's wonderful because they've read each piece of the paper. So it's not just getting them to read, it's getting them to read slowly and reflexively and start knitting things together and not being afraid to ask questions. So just as an example, in this class, I had 47 students by the time they got to this reading. So here's a first prompt, and 44 of all students are replying to these prompts throughout, okay? <laughs> They're reading the paper. You go down to some next prompts, which I'll get to real quick, and then close up. Um, they are, so you can see they're annotating really extensively. Um, and, uh, right. and so the, the amount of writing they put into this is similar to what they would do if they had to write a one or two page summary of what the paper is about, but it's just much more extensive. So I'm gonna close there on that and then go back to the presentation and close out with a few of um, the, 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 the lessons. So I've experienced this wild success by, create using, um, by using hypothesis as a way to coach them <laughs> outside the classroom so that when they come back to the classroom, um, they, they report feeling these things. Because they've read, they feel this personal pride. They're ready for a class like they've never been ready for a class before. They feel cared for, they talk about that, because they're getting what they crave. They just don't know how to read or why it's valuable. Um, and they're starting to even understand why it's important to be self-disciplined about things like reading at a, at a young age in their college experience, which is just great. And so, the one thing I want to close on is this point. It's not just that each individual person is reading and that I might be responding to them and saying, oh, that was a really interesting comment you made, Joe. Um, it's that they all walk into the classroom on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 12.30 and every, they know that everybody in the room read the paper, not just themselves, but that everybody read it and that I read all of their annotations. And so what that means is our conversation starts after everyone has done the reading. And I pull out certain things that seemed especially potent, and we talk about those things, and then apply it to whatever project we're doing, information science project we're doing in the class. So I can offload lots of things to outside the classroom, but the feeling that comes into the classroom is this kind of readiness and preparation, and this kind of commitment to each other around this learning experience. And that's what the breakthrough has been for me. This is just one classroom experience, and so in speaking to the themes that Jeremy and Alex and others are talking about in this room, is that you know, we no longer need to think about sources, uh, the, the, use of the, sources, the uses of the sources being divorced from each other. We can think about the network power of reuse of materials, uh, scholarly materials that can support contemplation, individual contemplation, and collaboration around scholarship, and this seems to be an essential thing that we need to do right now. So, thank you so much. Thanks. All right, if I hit slideshow, will it come back so that I don't have to crane my neck? Yeah. No. Hold on. I'll crane my neck. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, hi, I'm Alex, I'm from JSTOR. Uh, if you don't know who Ithaca is, come see me afterward. You should probably know. Some of you work for, for it. Um, I, <laughs> so first of all, I, I, I feel like I need that experience in a lot of the meetings that I go to um, because that experience of people having read the materials is important. Um, I, as you know, J I work for JSTOR. JSTOR is an enormous library, has an uh, incredible, rich, uh, uh, content, usually it's associated with the research enterprise, but all of that material is largely driven, is very important for the educational enterprise. You can see our little usage, annual usage chart at the bottom, huge peaks during ter when term papers are due, when students are doing research. Um, undergraduates writing papers is a large part of our usage, but some of our usage, a lot of it is actually driven by more directed usage, where a teacher 
here is sharing an individual link to a canonical article, sharing, including JSTOR material and syllabi, and we would want people reading this material, because it's just as complicated, some of it, as the material that Leisha was just, just showing, to have an experience in an environment where they can collaborate with their teacher and learn like that. Um, but there are some barriers and hurdles to that happening. Uh, so right now, teachers already do this. They share JSTOR materials with their classes. I'm sure they do that for some of your platforms as well. Um, that happens in a few ways. So a teacher might share a link um, in the syllabus. Uh, problem with that is that students tend to drop off, um, especially because the whole authentication thing gets really complicated and it's very easy, especially for when people are offline to not be able to authenticate or get lost in a proxy server somewhere. Teacher instead, to avoid that, could embed a PDF onto the, onto the, into the LMS. That allows the student to have immediate access, but the, nobody sees that usage, and so actually it's against JSTOR's terms and conditions, because that usage isn't, uh, isn't visible, and that's very important to our publishers to be able to see that. Um, teachers do it all the time, though. But. Though, and then even when they do get access, the students can have to read the material. And as we just saw, reading that material is really challenging and it's intimidating. And especially if I'm, you know, at a community college or an early undergraduate, getting the scaffolding and supports for that environment for, for, for those challenges is really important. Um, so uh, for the past year-ish, uh, we've been working on a pilot project uh, but between Hypothesis and JSTOR to solve that problem. Uh, we developed it about a year ago into the summer and it's been running at 30 institutions in the fall semester and the spring semester. We've been gradually expanding it to more and more institutions as there's been interest and we're seeing some positive results. Uh, we've worked with teaching and learning centers across at each of these institutions to build awareness, provide supports for teachers like Leisha to be able to use the integration, um, and have conducted follow-on quali qualitative interviews with those who have used the integration to make sure that it's worth scaling and that there are, um, nobody gets dropped in the handoff and all of that. So uh, what that's allowed us to do is have an environment where teachers can embed JSTOR material directly into the uh, LMS using the hypothesis integration and do so in a way that students immediately get authenticated at so they don't, there's nothing lost on the way and it's on the JSTOR platform so our publishers see the usage, we see the us usage and it's within our terms and conditions. Um, that then creates the environment that Leisha was talking about for collaborative learning and, uh, um, and uh, for collaborative learning. So let me show you what that looks like really quickly, although, um, and then we'll go from there. So you already saw with Leisha's quick demo uh, canvas, um, uh, this is a test version that we have. Teacher assigns an individual, in this case it's an article, um, one of the more canonical articles in JSTOR called What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Um, we're now, as you make an assignment, you select, uh, the teacher selects the tools that they want the, the, the um, students to engage in, whether it's a quiz or whatever. In this case, they select a hypothesis reading assignment and then choose JSTOR article. When you're putting together a syllabus, you have links of materials that you're going to refer your students to. Uh, that's what we ask for here. They can get that from the JSTOR platform. And then when they do that, what we're doing is, so the teacher has already authenticated into the learning management system. They just sign in, every learning management system has, a, has controls like that. That's associated with an institution. JSTOR, um, and so an institution code and Hypothesis gets access based on that. We've worked with Hypothesis to map the institution codes between Hypothesis and JSTOR so that we can then connect that we know we can look up for this teacher whether they have access to this uh, to this article. Uh, JSTOR is rapidly trying to expand access to all of its materials, um, but still there are some things that not everybody has access to. So we want to check that. We verify that they do, and if they do, they can go ahead and create the experience. This is a and so what this is essentially an iframe. So this is a hosted environment that they, the student gets to directly from the learning management system. 
The left side of the pane is JSTOR's part that's on JSTOR platform that's hitting every reuse hits JSTOR. Um, and this is significant use. So this is not just a single download, but you saw the number of co comments that Leisha was engendering. Every one of those refreshes is a page view and a content access that publishers and librarians should care about. Uh, one class of, one assignment of one article at UC Santa Cruz led to, to 30 people led to over 300 content accesses of that article. Um, that's great, we're, we're thrilled about that. Um, and then the students, don't have to re-authenticate, get access, and because it's at the site level, not individual, privacy is um, protected. We never, JSTOR doesn't know student accounts or your teacher accounts or anything like that, or see the annotations. Those annotations are then kept within the context. They can be kept private. As a, as a student, I can write notes to myself. I can write them to my class. If I have a hypothesis account, I can save them for perpetuity and archive them. I don't have to if I don't want to. But the, the context of this as a classroom is very important because annotations, we don't want all of social um, com conversation in the, in the wild. That conversation around your paper would have been very different if it were in a public forum. Um, and it creates this collaborative learning environment that can be really excited, uh, really powerful. That's especially important in an era where there are all of these forces like ChatGPT that may offer alternatives to the kind of close reading and engagement with materials that Hypothesis uh, and these tools can provide. Ch ChatGPT, I, I, you know, I would argue that especially in the humanities, a summary of an article is not the same thing as the article itself. And engaging with the actual text and language deepens the understanding. And Leisha's example absolutely testified to that. Uh, what we learned during this pilot was uh, that those who used it were over the moon at the um, uh, at the ease. We had very uh, a lot of very strong and positive uh, experiences. We did have some trouble, uh, some struggles driving awareness of this. JSTOR materials are not always thought of as textbook materials, so this was a little bit different kind of activity. But as they grow, as uh, teachers had awareness, um, we're seeing gradually increasing um, interest and value. And so over the next year, we're gonna be extending the pilot um, expand it to many more schools as we can. It's still a pilot, so there's some infrastructure that we need to continue to develop to scale that, um, build awareness. Uh, and then um, the other thing I'm really excited about is uh, sneaking in a plug to add image annotation. JSTOR is very interested in having, we have a lot of images that are vital to what we have on the collection and being able to annotate those in the same kind of environment is really exciting. Um, uh, can't be done now, but we're gonna be doing some testing to be able to do that. Um, and that's how what we're planning to do to scale it within JSTOR environment. And I'll hand it over to Jeremy about scaling beyond that. One concern I have is that we've made it look too easy for you guys uh, in terms of how all this works. Um, and so uh, we're now gonna turn to talk about scaling this operation or scaling this case study. Um, but I want, I've, I've heard that um, one of the things about CNI that's so great is that uh, it's not the presentations that are great, it's the conversations that follow. So now the pressure is on you guys because um, we're gonna provoke you in a, in a discussion of some of the topics that we've uh, brought up today. So um, you all know that uh, educational content is increasingly digital um, and that that content is delivered by many, many different platforms, some of them represented in the, in the membership here or in attendance. Um, and so students every day are navigating, um, they're going from the LMS as we saw and mul navigating multiple sources of content every day. Um, and they don't have a unified experience because sometimes those places have native tools that they can, they can leverage. Sometimes those content platforms do not. And then when they're in the LMS, they have other tools that they can access. And so even though it looks really easy to do what Leish is doing and what we're doing with the JSTOR pilot, there's still a lot of infrastructure, there's still a lot of work to be done to truly make a good experience uh, for students in this environment. Um, and I wanna return to a sort of mirror image of the problem that Hypothesis began with. Um, this is, you're gonna have to 
be ready for this, right? I want to hypothesize that some version of the original hypothesis hypothesis exists within the education space. Um, there's the LMS where a lot of content is being delivered. There's some learning tools that students can access in there. And then much of the content, most of the content that students are ac accessing is actually outside the LMS. And so they're moving back and forth and they have certain tools in some places and, and, and no tools in, the other, in other places or different tools in the other places. And so the problem that we're dealing with, I think, is trying to create a better experience for students and for scholars as they're navigating all these different platforms. And that's where we want to employ you guys <laughs> to start to think through, do you see this as a problem from your perspective, wherever you sit in this uh, marketplace? Uh, what are your challenges? Uh, how can we address those challenges together? And so with that, we're going to open it up for Q&A and discussion. Are there any questions, comments, thoughts? I have a question just about the longevity of the information. Like he mentions there are kind of work that you do so around privacy rights yeah. as a student. And you mentioned you used it in your class. At the end of the class, what happens to that data? Because he mentions that the students, if they have a hypothesis account, can still access it. But how long does it live in the classroom sphere even after the class <coughs> <laughs> so I'll answer a part of that, but I'll turn it back over to Jeremy to answer it fully. So the the so the demo I showed you was back was um, that reading is already nine months old. So so the 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 content lives indefinitely in the local Canvas instance, but students at least at CU don't have eternal access to that Canvas instance. Certainly, like, um, so I'll be teaching that same class again in the fall. I already know where, uh, based on things that students understood and what they didn't understand, how I want to introduce things, reintroduce things. So it's a, it's a, it's, so it's, it's a lot of data about student learning because it's all so externalized. Um, I also use it to prep the next time, the, the actual readings themselves. And so yes, having that content is helpful. Um, just as some small examples, I mean, this is much smaller, but you know, you know, one of the big things I do is write a lot of letters of recommendation for students. And it's really helpful to go back and say, what did Luis, how did Luis perform in that class? And what did he really think? And so I can write a much more, um, a much richer kind of, a much richer experience of each student that comes through. Um, and that's wonderful too. I mean, they come to me for other reasons because they know I know them through their, writings, even if they didn't talk in, 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 uh, in class. I'll just add that one of the things I think you'll appreciate about Dan and Hypothesis and how uh, we've gone about building this infrastructure is that it's been deeply archival in its nature, right? And that's part of the problem is some note-taking platforms aren't really attending to the true source of a document and to locating you know, commentary and discussion in those original sources. Um, and Hypothesis has built its infrastructure so that things are grounded in, you know, unique identifiers for documents, whether that's a web URL, a PDF fingerprint, or a stable URL in the case of, of the JSTOR integration. Um, but then the trick is showing those annotations in the proper contexts, right? So Laisha has probably continued access to her courses at CU Boulder. Um, she should be able to take her prompt annotations and move those to a new context, a new course. Um, those students, again, depending on the in university policy, may not be able to go back and see those annotations in context. Um, in the, in the course, but they're anchored to that document, and that document has a unique identifier in the world, again, whether it's a URL or PDF fingerprint, right? So theoretically, not all the infrastructure is built there, but theoretically, students in, in Glacier's course, if they graduate undergrad and they go to information science you know, graduate school and they go to a different university, and that university also has access to the same you know, repositories, um, they could, we can reconstitute their annotations for them in those new contexts because all the infrastructure is in place for them once they're in that, you know, have access to the content, they can call up their annotations again. Um, I hope that helps answer the question. Uh, it does include book chapters. So not entire books, but book chapters. I mean, theoretically, you could add 
a hundred chapters to get the whole book finished. So how do you keep focused? Are you having Great. Yep. He's already trying to get the publish five or six or seven and get the end book by the end of this year. Are you going to be working a little bit differently? Yep. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the crux of the problem right there and the crux of the opportunity. Um, and that's absolutely what uh, we're working on. The JSTOR implementation is meant to be a model for that others might follow. Um, we are working with some textbook publishers as well as uh, you know, in conversations with other journal uh, journals and journal uh, repositories. Um, but it really only works if we, that's the idea of the in interoperable infrastructure is that it has to include all these different partners, content uh, platforms, tool providers, um, for it really to be a universal, you know, seamless, uh, uh, experience for, for students and for scholars. And so we are in conversation. We've launched a coalition called the Social Learning Across Content Coalition, which includes a number of, uh, I think I actually have a slide for it. Um, well, I don't have a slide uh, that's not hidden. Um, but yeah, I think Elsevier is part of that, Dan, and uh, Hathi Trust. Um, EBSCO, uh, ProQuest. So all of these folks have committed to the idea of interoperability um, and starting to address the challenges of all working together so that tools like Hypothesis could work more easily across all those different content platforms. Um, and then JSTOR is one of the first sort of concrete prototypes that has come out of that conversation. Um, but it only works if uh, this is because you know, students and, and teachers are agnostic about the source of the content, right? I'm a big fan of JSTOR, but the article I might need is in, you know, EBSCO or ProQuest or something like that. And so unless I can access those other, you know, content providers, um, it's limited. For Alex, you said that the 30 students in Laisha's class generated 300 hits. It wasn't Laisha's class, it was oh, another It was another class. class. But it generated 300 hits against JSTOR. Content accesses, yeah. but yes. So are, aren't you afraid of in, hit inflation or, you know, having an artificially large amount? Uh, so the way JSTOR, and I'm not the best person to talk about this, but the way JSTOR accounts content accesses tries to uh, um, be careful with that with hit inflation, uh, which can happen when you're just doing web data. Content accesses is usually a single PDF download or a set number of page views within a session. And so 300 means they've come back multiple sessions. Um, uh, I mean, as far as, is that what you were talking about with inflation or are you worried, or do you think that JSTOR doesn't want that usage? Well, th or that th it's that it, it may affect your usage statistics in a way that is you're not prepared for. Uh, it's possible. I'd, 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 I think I'd love, like that problem. Right, yeah. Like, okay. I, I, that sounds like a good problem to then have to work through and see what we'd have to change to address, but I, I'd love to see that additional usage. So, and you are tracking it on a granular level as to yes. page views. Uh, yes, we, we, we log, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Yep. Counter, Counter, it's all counter five. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> Save me time, Bruce. Um, I'm a librarian, but I also adjunct, and I love thinking about the So I, I would just offer that as, 
Yes, and. <laughs> I have seen some interesting annotations done on on transcripts as a way yeah. that are time bound within the video, yeah. uh, and that can be a nice way to deepen the enrichment yeah. of of a of a video and sort of force that close reading for if you want to call it that of a of a video. Uh, hypothesis, I, hypothesis is working on image and video annotation this this oh, calendar year, so we're expecting to add that, but I think that's part of it, right? There are video annotation platforms and there are text annotation platforms and there are ways to mark up images, but if you're using a bunch of different places to take your notes and having your conversations and it's not unified, so you really need to have a system that's taken into consideration all the, not the content providers only, but also formats of different document types, images, video, et cetera. Yes. I guess I don't think about it like that. I, I mean, I have readings I need students to cover in a course. So I don't assign more or less to compel the reading. I, um, it's my, my attachment of what they learn in the reading to projects and things that are, is meant to compel them. And then, you know, if that doesn't work, but it usually does because we're all, we all then become pretty invested together. Then some, what's great about Hypothesis is that it's integrated with the learning management system and you can assign, I don't care if it's one point out of a thousand or 10 points out of a thousand, they will still read that paper. You know, it's just like, you know, so, so, so there's just all those things together that keep them. So I don't, so I don't do more or less because of that. I just want them to read the ones I say and please commit to that. Yeah. The guardrails really help with that. Um, I was wondering, I know you, you know, said that you had rather than having three annotations, or three prompts. Yes. That you sort of expanded it throughout. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, sort of your learning curve yep. beyond that. And then as well, this looks amazing. You know, I think each one of these is an evangelist. But <laughs> I love it. Yeah. She's going to earn an administrative role, actually, for all her advocacy for <laughs> hypothesis. On, I've already um, done Boulder's campus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my learning curve was three semesters, which wasn't that bad, because the first semester was still a success, just not, I wasn't as honed in, in what I came to by the third semester. So, um, so what I didn't show you was that in addition to the prompts that I asked students to, to write to, they are also writing additional ones on their own. There's lots. I mean, I must have, I don't know, maybe maybe 800 annotations per paper like that for 50 students or something like that. I don't know. Um, so that's question one. So so what I what I did learn was that um, the, the biggest shift in my practice was asking students, grads as well, asking them to annotate at least three times in a, pa pa in a paper or in an article, um, they would do three times. And they would do the beginning and the end and then somewhere in the middle. They, so they weren't reading it. It was more than before because I at least got them to open up the file, right? And so then I'm like, okay, I have to be. And so then I, the slide we skipped because I was using too much time um, and that's my fault, was I, wa I, I realized I could use this as my, a virtual me. So if I could read, so I'm teaching ethnography class right now for computer science, which sounds crazy, I know, but, but and it's with 50 students. And when you're teaching ethnography class, ideally you just wanna teach five people at a time and you wanna go out into the world and show them how to see things, but you can't do that. So, my, so the whole philosophy is how do you, how can you coach students without being there? And so what the annotations do, yes, it gets them to read the paper, and I have to make them do that, but I prompt in a way that I'm acting like a coach, like I'm always whispering in their ear as though I'm reading right next to them. And so some of, the, of that heavy stuff around the Tuskegee stuff, a lot of these students had never heard of it before. Um, and we could get to the end of the paper and they've read some really disturbing things about this information online right now and how black Americans are being attacked. And at the end, I asked them, how are you feeling about this? How are you feeling about your classmates? What do you want to bring to the classroom? 
And that's that kind of coaching slash therapist maybe a little bit, which gives them at least a place to kind of talk about that reading and, and perhaps bring it back to the classroom or at least let others read it there even if they don't want to talk about it. So that's how it evolved, knowing that I could be that kind of person to them and not just read the paper. I could be their coach and their person that supports them. And I think with that, uh, we're, we're at time, but we're gonna be around for the remainder of this uh, conference, so please pull us aside, and I hope you guys will you know, consider that you know, what Leisha's been, what, what Leisha's done, supporting students, giving students an opportunity for peer learning and the kind of difficult content that some of you are providing or some of you are storing on your campus is really important to get them to engage with. So thanks for everything. Thank you.